Good afternoon for everyone who's joining us this afternoon for our final webinar of this series. Uh, my name is Zara McDonald. I'll be talking with you today alongside Courtney, who is uh, going to be driving this presentation. So we're going to get started now. And today we are actually talking about non-invasive research methods that we have adopted over the last seven or eight years that um, really provide some good texture to the research as well as allowing us to keep our hands off wildlife, which we really like. So Courtney, let's get going. And we will also take your questions in the Q&A. And uh, we have a chat open for you to make comments and tell us where you're from. And we have some info in there for you guys. And uh, we are also taking your questions at the end. And if I see anything pop up during the presentation that we'd like to answer um, sooner, we will do that. So thanks for joining us. Hey, everybody. Um, oops, sorry. This technical difficulties. Let me start at the beginning. Um, I don't know why it's going right into the middle of my presentation. So let me start up here. So I just want to introduce you all to the, the two of us that are talking today, um, Zara and I'm Courtney. Um, we work with the Field Aid Conservation Fund and the Bay Area Puma Project. Um, we're going to be doing this a little um, less formal than some of the other talks. So I'm going to be talking and Zara's going to be talking and it's going to be more a little bit more of a discussion. Um, so as Zara said, as we go through, if you have questions, pop those into the Q&A and um, we'll either talk about them as we go or at the end. So let's start with the problem. So we are entering the sixth mass extinction that our planet has seen. Um, and it's caused by humans for a variety of reasons, climate change, pollution, habitat loss, um, many ways that we're changing the, the shape of the planet and how it functions. Um, and this has led to a huge declines in pretty much every animal, plant, um, species that we, um, that we know of. And it's really important that we try to start doing something now. Um, what we do now is going to change the course of how this extinction progresses. Um, there's been some really nice published uh, research on this topic, um, especially there's two nice papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, and then there's also some really nice, um, a little easier to read, really nice um, infographics um, that you can find in places like the New York Times. If you're interested in either of any of those publications, um, just uh, give us a shout and we can send those over to you. Um, and I'd also be remiss if uh, I didn't talk about how um, this is linked to environmental justice issues. So at this point in time, this has become really the, come to the forefront of a lot of our minds, um, how this environmental degradation is disproportionately affecting people of color, especially in the US um, and citizens of developing countries. Um, they're the ones that are really experiencing the brunt of this, the climate change, pollution, um, loss of biodiversity and so forth. Um, but I also want to point out that environmental justice is also for animals, justice for animals. Um, and that's um, kind of what is steering us into non-invasive techniques at this time. Um, Zara, did you want to add anything at this point? No, I think I just want to highlight that it, that it is critical what we do it was on the previous slide in the next 10 to 50 years that is defining for humanity. So I think just highlighting that is really important. And I don't think people quite grasp that yet. So um, it's important to pay attention to. 
right? Especially with climate change, we're really looking at short windows of time before things are really ingrained. Um, so with that bit of bad news, what can we do moving forward? So um, there's really three pillars of conservation. Um, and they, there's a lot of crosstalk and feedback between these pillars of um, scientific research, um, community-driven action, and education. And I don't, Zara, what, did you wanna add a little bit more to this? Yeah, I think when we think of wildlife conservation and these three pillars, or say three legs of a stool, if we remove one of these pillars or legs, the work is less effective and can break down. So they guide our approach to the work we do. And Courtney's gonna go a little bit more into each of these individually, but you will see once she does how they are connected. Exactly, that's exactly right. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the science is, um, is not, none of these things are um, as useful on their own as they are when all three are present. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, the first pillar, which is scientific research. So for Felidae Conservation Fund, um, we have a number of research projects that we've recently completed or that are currently in progress. Um, I've gone over a lot of these um, in greater depth in the first webinar, um, in the webinar series, and those are gonna be available on YouTube. Um, so you can reach out to us and we can send those to you. Um, but just briefly, we've looked at body condition in Pumas in the Bay Area, um, predictors of wildlife roadkill, specifically on I-280, and also um, predicted habitat preferences for Bay Area Pumas. Um, right now, we have uh, two, two big, three big projects going on. Um, so looking at the effects of the shelter in place orders on wildlife. Um, and then we're also um, taking our habitat preference project and, and moving it forward. So figuring out which of those habitat fragments pumas actually use based on our model. Um, and then modeling future availability of habitats. So we know that climate change and further development in the Bay Area is gonna make a lot of habitat less useful for pumas and other wildlife. Um, so trying to figure out where, um, where efforts should be placed to really maintain um, habitat connectivity and usefulness for wildlife. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of move into um, the research method, methods that um, Felidae is and has used. Um, and those really fall into two categories. So something that we're calling invasive methods and then non-invasive methods. Um, invasive methods are where we actually handle the animals, whereas non-invasive are um, hands-off approaches that we're, we that we're taking now. So early on in the project, we were doing um, some collaring and some microchipping, and that takes that requires um, a three different steps to get the type of data that we um, that we were aiming for. And the first thing is um, finding puma. So you can do this in a number of ways. Um, you can do this through camera trapping, um, through baiting, which means leaving out hunks of meat. Um, and also with hounds. Um, and I'm gonna show you two videos. Did you wanna set up these videos, Zara? Um, play them. Yeah, you can play them. Um, yeah, so usually what we use for baiting is roadkill, just to add that, roadkill deer. So what you're seeing right here is a puma that has been treed by hounds. So you can hear the hounds in the background. Um, so the cat has been driven up the tree by the hounds. Yeah, so often when we do this work and, and, and I'll let this play while I'm talking, but this is just a cat jumping to take some bait that we placed in a tree. And uh, we, had, we got a number of hits on this bait and eventually it was gone. 
Um, but the, the puma in the tree, oftentimes they will sit up in the trees for extended hours if we can't reach them and they can even spend the night up in those trees and it's quite stressful for them. This cat is just uh, getting its meal here. Free, free meal. Free meal. It looks like it's working through its options right now. The strong jaws of the puma there. Okay, so that's how we get pumas to get into a location that we, where we can actually move on to the second step, which is catching the pumas. And from there, we have um, a few options. Um, cage trapping. So what we often, what, what's often done in these situations is um, the remainder of the bait animal or perhaps a, a kill that's been found, um, a puma kill. Um, is wired into a spring-loaded trap. This is very similar to if you're um, familiar with like um, feral cat traps. The, this is just basically a, a big giant version of those. Um, so we have that option. We also have leg snares and I'll play a video of what those look like in just a minute. And then the last is train, which is what we saw in the previous video. So here's, this is what a leg snare looks like. So in this video, this cat is stressed because we are close to darting this cat just so we can anesthetize it to work it up. So he's not happy and you see that from obviously it's, it's energy and um, one of the reasons this is a more stressful technique that was actually um, outlawed in California some years ago um, is because it is more stressful than the other techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, so then uh, the next step after a puma has been captured and anesthetized um, is to do the workup. So that might include um, collecting biological samples like hair, blood, feces, um, and it, it's often nowadays um, to place a collar or um, an intra-abdominal chipping device, um, which actually provides real-time movement data. So the reason that these um, methods are used are typically to do um, work that can't be done in any other way. So if you're interested in, say, um, determining infectious disease prevalence, you really have to have a blood sample for that. So that absolutely requires um, anesthetizing and capturing a puma. Um, if you want real-time movement data, that requires placing a collar. So if you're really interested in um, movement patterns or something of that sort, um, these methods are, are very valuable to, to those um, types of projects. Yeah, there have also been some innovative techniques used up in Washington in recent years with the BioDart. And that means you're not actually handling the animal, but the dart is fired into the animal and releases with that material that you would get from capturing and drawing blood. So that's also a nice way to do it now without capturing. And the, just one other addition to the collars is previously it was all radio telemetry. And uh, radio telemetry was what we were using for kittens as well, which would really require us to go out and find the animal. So it re re really was less real time, but more, you know, we could find it if it was within a certain range and our radio antenna would allow us to find it through techniques we learn as biologists. But the newer techniques give us the capabilities of the satellite transfer. So that's closer to real time. It's not quite real time, but it's, it's definitely a step up. And so it's allowed us to glean a lot of new insights into the movements and behaviors as Courtney has suggested. And that's one of the, one of the, the cats we call her, the movement of that female is over here to the right on this map. I think it's yeah. about six months, right, Courtney? 
Um, yeah, and, and do you remember how often we were getting data points from this animal? Yeah, we were getting data on this animal every two hours. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of what, what you'll see over, um, over like a six month period, that amount of movement data. Um, oh, this it says November through May, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the collaring and, and so forth. Um, but so we've used this in the past, um, but we've stopped and, and the reasons are multifold. Um, it's very expensive. It's running a capture is very time consuming to, to set it up um, and to catch the puma and sometimes it's not fruitful. Um, it's risky and um, as technology gets better and better, it becomes less and less necessary. Um, the animals are likely to be stressed out um, or even injured. And there's also an infectious disease risk, which and we'll go into those two points a little bit um, more deeply. Did you wanna say anything else here before I show the video, Zara? I forgot which video this is, so start it and I will, <laughs> I will uh, speak to it. Oh, this is a cool video. So this cat is uh, trying to get away from the hounds and you'll see the hounds take chase, but the, the puma is amazing and, and just uh, quite a sight to see. It's, it moves away pretty quickly, but eventually the, the hounds catch up to it because pumas have a very limited amount of time where they can run at full speed. So the puma can go up to about 40 miles an hour and that's, you know, and then it's exhausted. And this cat actually had had a full meal the night before. So he exhausted a little bit sooner. And this is, is this in Argentina? This is in Chile. So this is in Patagonia. Shit. Oops, sorry. <laughs> move before that place. Yeah, sorry. our videographer realized he was behind. <laughs> behind the, the the crowd the group um so the next point i just wanted to make is that many or all of these techniques of capturing pumas um, often lead to some sort of injury so the these are just some some small tables that kind of summarize in different papers how these animals are affected um, anywhere from minor skin damage and swelling to um, vertebral and leg fractures for the leg snares. Um, if dogs are also used, they um, quite frequently experience last cuts and, and things um, that can be quite painful as well. Um, and then we have another video here. Um. So just to emphasize how stressful, uh, you know, and animals handled this experience differently, but this, uh, this cat is actually um, falling under the influence of the anesthesia. So some of these cats will respond quite calmly whereas others will get quite agitated and excited and damage their faces trying to get out. So this is another reason why it's, it's not, in our, in our minds, the best approach to collecting this data at this point in time. So, and then um, the last point I wanted to make is that pumas um, can carry several zoonotic diseases. And by zoonotic, I mean um, diseases that typically have wildlife reservoirs, but um, can pass into humans. Um, a lot of tick-borne infections fall into this category. So like Lyme disease, cat scratch fever, um, anaplasmosis, um, and then other ones like Toxoplasma gondii, um, this is the same disease when if you were to get pregnant, doctors tell you not to clean the litter box. It's because of this um, disease called toxoplasma, um, toxoplasmosis. Um, Q fever and even plague 
um, which is a bacterial disease. And we were very saddened um, to, to lose a biologist back just in 2007 from plague um, after he uh, was handling an infected mountain lion. So this, this is a very serious and real threat to the biologists that um, may be handling these animals. Um, yeah, to add to that, Eric um, was conducting a necropsy when this occurred. So um, it is, it, they did not have a lab currently for him to work within at the Grand Canyon, and this is what, where this occurred. Um, and plague is endemic in the West. Um, however, it does raise questions about biologists in the field and the risks to those of us who spend time in the field and if we are handling animals, um, the risk raises considerably. And especially today, there's, there's more consideration being given to um, you know, whether we really do need to handle these animals because there is a risk. And uh, the encroachment that we are seeing in these communities at the urban edge also increases that risk. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that kind of concludes the, the bit about um, capturing pumas. Now we're gonna go into some of the research methods that we're using now that are non-invasive. Um, and our primary way that we're collecting data right now is with the use of wildlife camera traps. We have about 140 of these in the field at any given time. Um, we're monitoring where pumas are occurring, how, um, how much activity is occurring in those locations, and what the biodiversity is like in places where pumas are and are not present. Um, so we like to set up our cameras where we think we'll get a puma, but it's also important for us to set up cameras where we don't expect to get a puma because we're interested in comparing biodiversity and other um, metrics in those locations to places where we do see pumas. Um, this is one of our Volunteers, Andrew. He's got a, um, He's monitoring a, a wildlife camera for us in um, Nicasio. Um, so another uh, avenue that we're exploring is hair snares, um, and this is kind of a, a weird name for something. It, it's grabbing hair off of the animal in uh, with as little contact as possible. So um, the two pictures down below are. Uh, two examples of hair snares, and I'm going to show you a video of a bobcat actually going into something that was set up for a puma. So that's why the um, the snare is actually a little bit higher. It um, looks like it's got some sticky tape on it. Um, so it's up high so that it would touch a puma's back so we don't get too much um, non-puma hair. So because other animals, bobcats, foxes, like to go in there and check out. We often have lures inside, usually audio or scent lures um, inside there to, to draw the animal in. Yeah, 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 it's good. Um, and this takes advantage of natural cat rubbing behavior. So if you have a cat at home or have ever lived with cats or been around cats, you know they, they do this rubbing behavior pretty naturally. Um, in the background there, you can hear an audio lure. So it sounds like um, a, a deer or fawn in distress, um, and that will bring the cat in closer. And if you managed to see the video at the beginning before we actually started, there were a couple of videos in there of cats rubbing on our snares set previously or hair collection stations set and one was going to town on our on our setup there so we're just trying to get a more consistent response for our research mm -hmm. and the reason that we're after hair specifically um, is for a number of reasons um, it's a very rich biological sample it it um, can be used to analyze things like diet, um, levels of stress, and also different aspects of genetics, um, including identifying the sex as male or female, um, the individual, and um, even deeper genome level questions. And the nice thing about hair, in particular, it has a really long shelf life. 
um, which means you can collect it, put it in uh, um, a clean envelope and, and keep it for, for a long period of time. It doesn't take up much space um, versus something like blood, which you have to keep in a freezer. Um, it takes up a lot of room in those little tubes and so forth. Um, the other thing is hair has a really interesting um, sample period. So um, again, comparing it to blood, um, usually if you take a blood sample, you're getting information about the individual that's very, um, that varies on the hour to day um, versus something like hair, which um, varies by season because they're going to keep their hair until they shed it and it's going to grow over several months period. Um, so those samples can be, can give you information about what's happened further back in the past than say a blood sample. Um, and then the other method that we're using is scat collection. So scat like hair um, can be used to analyze a lot of um, ecological or biological questions about pumas like diet and stress level and genetics. Um, it also has a very long shelf life after you dry it. So you have to we actually have a very special <laughs> dehydrator um, in our office that we use to dry out scat samples. Um, does not smell good for a while, but after that you're good to go. Um, and we like to you or we like the um, scat sampling because it also has a different um, uh, sampling time than hair does. So hair has this seasonal aspect to it. Scat, usually you're getting information about the puma on say the last week. Um, you're, get, you're getting that sort of information. Um, collection of scat can go one of two ways. It can be active or passive. Um, for pumas, it pretty much has to be active, which means um, you are usually using scent dogs um, to find the scat. And that's because pumas tend to cover their scat. Um, bobcats, on the other hand, you can use either active or passive scat collection methods. Um, and that just means walking around and finding it because um, bobcats will actually poop on a trail or um, somewhere that's visible. So um, there's a nice picture down at the bottom that shows a scrape. So a, a bobcat's um, kicked up some dirt, pooped in the hole. Um, and then I'm gonna show you a video. Um, I saw earlier that we have some four and five year olds watching. This usually is, is a hit with them. Um, this is a bobcat pooping on trail. We got it on our camera, We're pretty excited about that. Um, and we're using, especially um, for bobcats, um, we've developed a project in Marin, specifically in the Marin headlands. Um, and some citizen scientists were helping us hike along these different trails in the headlands to collect bobcat scat. And we did this um, to develop some protocols for individual identification. So the map at the bottom of the screen are the different individuals that we identified based on SCAT. Um, you can see some of them specifically number seven and number one. Um, we collected multiple SCATs from those animals. So if you do this um, pretty regularly, you can get an idea of home range size for these animals. Um, we're actually trying to develop the projects so that we can move in or move towards um, urban edge in comparing um, genetic diversity and home range size. Um, and so we can compare those in urban edge bobcats as compared to more wildland bobcats. Uh, one thing I'm going to add about the hair and scat collection a benefit for us to use this non-invasive approach for pumas is that if you are typically working with collared animals and you're, you're checking out kill sites to see what they've been feeding on, you're not gonna get the small critters they eat 
and this will enable us to understand if a, if a puma is actually taking a pet and or what types of small mammals it's eating as well and that's something that we cannot learn from collars yep very good point um so all of this were, were um was to show you this research scientific research pillar um towards conservation and and the real end cap to scientific research is publication and that's where you actually will write up um, your methods and your findings and put them into context in a discussion and um, they're reviewed by your peers and then disseminated to, to academia. But that's really um, narrow in scope, the people who are going to read this because um, it's written in academic ease, for lack of a better word. It's, it's almost a different language the way that it's written. Um, so that's why we need the other two pillars is to really um, get this information into the hands of people that are actually going to use it and benefit from it. So we're going to move on to discussing the other two pillars. Um, the first of which is working with communities. I just want to check in, Zara, is there anything else you wanted to say about scientific research before I move on? Oh, I think we covered it well. Cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about working with communities to us. This is uh, a really important aspect of our work um, and it really takes two, um, two routes. One is um, human wildlife conflict mitigation and the other is engaging with communities. So let's start with conflict mitigation. Um, what I mean by this is that we're working to um, reduce fear um, for wildlife and reduce these conflicts. And conflicts can take um, a number of different, um, or can, can look differently. So um, it could be domestic animal depredation. So puma, think pumas taking um, cats, dogs, goats, those types of things. Um, it could be property damage caused by wildlife. So um, automobile accidents with um, wildlife. Um, or crop damage by wildlife. Um, and then the, the last one is really retaliatory killings. Um, so if, a, say, a puma takes a domestic animal, um, oftentimes where uh, people want to go out and, and kill this animal. Um, so what are we doing? So we really take a um, personalized approach to this, um, we really take into consideration the, the stakeholder that's involved or stakeholders that are involved um, to provide really specific resources and suggestions depending on their specific needs. Um, we do have some more general guidances for ranchers and hobby animals, hobby animal owners. Um, and we're starting to work in, uh, work in community meetings. So facilitating communities to, that have multiple stakeholders and have them work together to figure out how they want to work with wildlife, how they wanna deal with wildlife in their communities. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this um, really feeds back into the other pillars, um, the other two pillars that we've talked about. So one is we're completing scientific research that really informs the, the best mitigation practices um, to be used for these um, human wildlife conflict situations. Um, and also providing general education both to um, young people and to adults. Um, so that they uh, can perhaps thwart any of these conflicts before they happen. Yeah, so we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll talk uh, more about the community approaches that we have. And we also had a webinar on this last week. So if you're interested and you did not get a chance to see that, uh, reach out to us and we're happy to share that. But um, one of the added benefits to are working with, working with and training citizen scientists is that they 
once trained up and understanding what is actually walking by that camera will help us directly mitigate conflict um, simply by sharing that information with their communities and relaying the actual, in the, the actual real data as opposed to uh, spreading misinformation, which happens often in these communities. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that it's very well linked to the community engagement um, that Daryl was just talking about. And what we mean by community engagement is really working collaboratively with um, both partners, with stakeholders, with the public um, to figure out the best way to um, sustainably and successfully conserve wildlife. Um, and that's going to look different for different communities. Um, and that has to be respected. Um, as as they move forward. So how we are doing it is, um, as I mentioned, with these community outreach uh, programs. So this is a picture of our um, first community program, which was in La Honda down in San Mateo County. Um, and we're looking to expand these um, into more communities. Um, like Sarah said, we've, we gave a talk about if you missed it, um, then reach out to us and we can send you that information. Okay, and then the final pillar that I just wanted to briefly touch on, because um, that was also, this was, some of this information was also talked about last week, um, is education. So we do this in a number of ways as well. We have um, a K through 12 program that's called Cat Aware. Um, we have many online resources, including a game called Puma Wild, Puma Wild um, that's really hard and I can't beat it. So um, if you're really into gaming, that's a good hard one to do. Um, we also try to get our information out through the uh, various um, media. So articles, interviews with magazines on television and so forth and podcasts. Um, and then we like to do like what we're doing right now, these webinars, um, in-person presentations in a different time, we were doing a lot of those, um, storytelling and going to stakeholder meetings to really um, educate people about conservation of wildcats. Do you wanna add anything here, Zara? Uh, one thing I'll add is our Cat Aware program is is sort of uh, in a changing process. We are transitioning this program to an online program so that we can share it with schools remotely. And so if you're interested in that, you can reach out to us, but stay tuned to hear more about the changes there and when that may be back online for you to access. Great. Okay. Um, so we're just going to kind of wrap up here now at the end um, and really talk about ways that um, we think you guys can make a difference. Um, the first one is just sharing what you know about pumas and puma conservation with um, your friends and your family. Um, and if you want more resources, you can check us out online. We have um, a Bay Area Puma Project specific website, and then also a Field Day Conservation Fund website. We're on Facebook. We post lots of really fun pictures there and on Instagram, um, and then LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, and if you miss any of this information, um, feel free to reach out to us and we can send it to you. Um, the other thing we always need help with is collecting data. So sharing your sightings, whether that be from your nest or ring or backyard um, camera traps, um, we are very interested in those. Um, you can add any of those sightings or um, sightings that you have out in the field to our back.org sightings map. Um, and then we also need help in the field with our own wildlife cameras. Like I said, we have about 140 of them out right now. Um, what do you think, Sarah? Maybe like 80% of them are being checked by volunteers at this point? Yeah, I would say even more than that. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, we had a little bit of a, a, a lull there when we were all sort of in shelter in place mode, but um, things have become quite active again. Yes. Um, so if that's something that interests you, please reach out. Um, if you're interested in helping in other ways, um, we are very happy to have um, you volunteer whatever it is that you're good at. So whether that be um, bookkeeping, design, GIS, grant writing, um, all of those things can be incredibly helpful for us. Um, we also, like I said, we have 140 cameras out there. Many of them take somewhere between hundreds and thousands of photos a month, um, which means we have a huge glut of data coming in. Um, and that needs to be converted into, the, each one of those um, pictures needs to be cataloged depending on what species is in it. Um, and that's something that's really fun to do remotely. Um, you get to know some local wildlife and um, you get to see some really cute pictures. This is a picture I just got last week from when I checked um, a Mount Diablo camera, really pretty dark. Um, also, donations are incredibly useful at this time in particular. Um, I'm sure you know that uh, nonprofits are hurting especially hard um, with all this shelter in place. A lot of our funding is, um, comes from places like zoos and other things that are shut down. Um, so that's always very helpful as well. Um, if you're interested in volunteering, reach out to our office manager, Kat. Um, you probably have noticed her chatting in the chat windows. Um, and there's her email address posted there. And then with that, um, I think if Zara has anything else to add, and then after that, we can um, start to answer some of your questions. Yeah, no, I think we're going to head straight into the Q&A. And I think we have some, some questions there. Uh, so how should we do this? Do, Ginger, do you want to read them or should I just go through them. I can do that too. Let's do that. So Marnell, yeah, Ginger, would you like to? No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, Marnell, thanks for this. Um, so when we use a hound to find a puma, the puma might be treated even for the whole night until the next day. Are the dogs sent out unsupervised without a human? Um, never. Uh, wouldn't it be possible to only use the dogs with people close behind ready to respond as soon as the puma is found? And yes, you're absolutely right. That's how we do it. And uh, the, there have been inst instances that I can describe to you where I've had to camp out under a tree with uh, some field crew and we had to wait out a puma up in the tree. And that was, um, that's not been very often but it was when we needed to place a collar on that particular animal and we needed to do it, you know, we did, we'd already treated it maybe nine times and were unsuccessful and this was a safe, uh, the safest way to proceed. So um, we will never send dogs out alone. I mean, they do, they'll, they'll run ahead and if they find, uh, if, they, if they catch up to the puma and the puma trees, they'll, they'll, they're trained to wait and they will bark and they'll just wait. And when we show up, that's when we decide, make a plan, what's safe, how can we dart the animal. Oftentimes the animal will leave the tree before we can get there. And so we may end up with this chase through several trees before we actually can, can dart the animal safely. So that's a, a great question. Uh, Richard. You stopped using invasive methods, but aren't they, they aren't questions answered only by them? And second, leg snares are more stressful, but aren't they safer? Um, so um, I'm gonna let Courtney add on to this, but I'm gonna start out by saying that you know what she said was was pretty on target, which is the blood work we receive when we capture pumas, yes, we can collect a number of other samples that we wouldn't otherwise collect. However, as I mentioned, the bio dart is a nice option where we, aren't, we, we are not actually capturing the puma. And we have a lot of new capabilities coming online, including molecular environmental soil science, which is going to give us a lot of answers about what moved on that soil. Um, and so we can track what animals are moving where. 
and we've got um, new robots that are taking video and going into where animals move. So that may be something we can use for these large mammals at some point in time. Um, the leg snares, lastly, are, yes, more stressful, and they can be, that's a tough question to answer because they, they aren't necessarily safer because cats can lose digits. And if they are in a snare for a long period of time, their paws can get so swollen that it doesn't actually, um, it can do damage that may come down in a few days or it may not. So there's, there's a number of things that can occur. And, um, you know, I've worked in, with snares around the world and in the best case scenario, they have swollen paws. Even if we move in on that animal within 30 minutes of it going into the snare, simply because an animal does not like to be constrained when it's wild. So that probably makes sense to you. But Courtney, do you have thoughts on this question as well? Um, I, didn't, I didn't hear the whole question, so I'm not sure if you want me to speak to something specifically. Um, it, was, it was really just, we stopped using invasive methods that uh, might only be answered, or aren't they, aren't questions answered only by them if oh. we are collaring? And I, I think we did sort of answer that, but I, I partially just answered that again, but if you have yeah. additional thoughts. So yeah, so the, the types of questions that we're really focused on, which um, right now is um, what sort of habitats, um, what specific parcels of habitat uh, we need to try to conserve or we need to try to um, create linkages between because of changes that we see coming down the pipeline. Um, those questions are not easily answered by any of the methods. Um, so we would prefer to use a non-invasive method if, um, if we have the choice. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna to toss this next one to you. What protocol do they use to analyze cougar feces, fecal matter? So it depends, there are multiple um, different methods. So the easiest of which is really literally picking it apart and looking for bone fragments um, and hair. Um, and uh, a very good naturalist can identify based just on those uh, bone fragments and hair pieces um, based on coloration and so forth. Um, the next step would be to take those fragments and hair to a lab and um, it's called uh, DNA barcoding. So a, most, a, a number of vertebrate species um, have a, a DNA barcode in them and you can send them to, to the lab and have each hair or each um, bone fragment identified um, in the lab. Um, so that's for diet analysis. If you're interested in things like stress, you can actually um, extract stress hormones, um, corticosterones from the feces. Um, and you can also extract DNA. So both of those are very lab heavy techniques um, that require special equipment and so forth. All right. So from Christina, actually, let me go to Megan. Megan, I've always wondered if collars interrupt animals' quality of life or typical behavior. And uh, your wondering is, is spot on, Megan. Um, we have evidence that they do. And uh, I will give you a quick story about an animal we collared um, in East Bay. And this female, after the day after she was collared, um, disappeared and, and took off north and left her home range for over six months before she finally returned. But she was clearly freaked out from that experience and it caused her to, to leave the area for some time. But we do know that putting a big hefty collar on an animal um, will have some level of impact on their behaviors and quality of life. It's a question of, you know, how much that is. And, and if the 
you know, if the cost is worth it. And I think a lot of science in the past has said it's worth it. So the question remains. And I think for us, we've already decided the answer to that question in the current day for us. Um, and I would just add um, that it also depends on the animal. So just like with people, you have animals that have very have varied personalities and um, different histories and so forth and how they react is very different. Some pumas um, seem to get on all right with it. Um, I mean, you, we have a data of puma, of collared animals, you know, giving birth and raising babies and being successful. Um, and then stories like what Zara said of just some animals just really freaking out and having a hard time coping with it. Yeah, it's really hard to know, you know, what the real answer is to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can't, we can only anecdotally answer that question based on experiences we have and, and the, the studies that are ongoing. And, you know, it's, it just, again, as Courtney said, it depends on the animal. We had a snow leopard in Pakistan who um, seemed to do fine catching prey, even though the BBC crew wanted to follow her and prove to us that she couldn't catch prey after we collared her. And so they ended up coming back to us and saying, okay, it's all right. Um, you know, we, we are okay with this. So it is just, it's all relative, like, like a lot of this work. Next question from Christina. Again, I'm going to toss these hair and scat deals to you, Courtney. What kind of technology is needed for hair analysis as a biological sample? Sorry, say that again. What type of um, equipment? Te technology is needed for oh. hair analysis. So um, it depends on what you're doing. Um, but things like genetic work is mostly done with something called um, a PCR or a qPCR machine. Um, PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Um, and basically what it does is it looks for um, certain genes in the animal. Um, and those genes can, you can look for genes based on specific physiological questions that you might have, um, or um, some basic genetic questions about like um, diverse, genetic diversity within a population, um, sex, um, individual identification, it can all be done with this PCR machine. Um, other things like uh, looking for stress hormones, um, that requires typically um, a, you do something called, using an ELISA plate. Um, so it's a, a multi-weld plate that you'll, um, you'll extract the corticosterone and then you can measure how much of the, that stress hormone is in the sample. And for that you need, um, they, they change colors depending on how much stress hormone is in it. Um, so not very much hormone, you'd get a very light color in the well um, versus the more hormone that you have, the, the brighter the color. So there's um, some special equipment that you need to um, determine those colors at a very um, high accuracy so you can compare them to one another. I hope that answers your question. All right, and from Tavish. Another question. Yeah, uh, we have a few more to get through here. From Tabitha, uh, you mentioned that pumas carry several zoonotic diseases. What research have you done on this or what papers have you used for this information? I know they carry zoonotic diseases. I was just looking for more information about what kinds and how they spread. And the short answer before um, I let Courtney finish this is uh, that we don't know. We haven't looked at it yet. We've discussed it and we'd like to, but we haven't embarked on that yet. Yeah, so that's something that we're very interested in pursuing in the future. Um, it will require um, either collecting blood samples, um, depending on the zoonotic disease that we're interested in. Some of them you can also detect in feces, um, but not all of them, especially not if they, it's a really um, 
low level infection, it can be really hard, difficult to detect in any way other than with blood. Um, so we haven't really looked here in the Bay Area, um, but there are a few labs that are doing this work, the ones that are doing um, collaring um, down in Southern California. Um, and also UC Davis has a nice program. Um, if you're interested in some papers, shoot me an email and I'm happy to share those with you. Okay, how long have the wildlife cams been providing data? When were they initially deployed? Um, Chloe, we actually deployed these first in 2010 before cameras were really um, being used widely. And I think a lot of our data starts around 2011, 2012, but um, not at the magnitude with which we've got cameras placed now. So that grew dramatically over the last six years. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we have um, a lot of data and I think um, upwards of six million images and video at this point in time. So we're still trying to get through all that data because as you know, with a, with a, uh, a research set of grids of 140 cameras, we have continual data coming in, so. Yes, Thank we have, and just to add to that, we have some um, some historical relics in our office of the <laughs> very first cameras, and they're like twenty pounds. They're, yeah, they're we do. Nuts. They're like almost, yeah, yeah. The data just seems <laughs> almost not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've come um, a okay, so we have a few more questions, so we can get you guys out of here soon. But from Scott, as with multiple. Whoops, my window. As with multiple cat species that have large ranges, it seems logical to think that habitat destruction is a major contributing factor in the challenge for conservation. What are the other issues, such as the retaliation of the human and animal interaction? Um, you know, this is a great question, and you're absolutely right. And I'm going to toss this to Courtney as well. So I would, um, in, in the interest of saving time, um, I went over a number of different ways that pumas are being threatened um, almost exclusively by humans through various methods um, in the first webinar. So if you want, you can um, shoot us an email and I'm happy to share that with you. And I can even tell you like what minute of the presentation to, to jump into to really answer that question fully. Cause otherwise I can go into a lot of detail. <laughs> Yeah, and, the, and the, the last thing, Scott, to um, pay attention to or check in with us again on is the, the, the work we're currently doing on fragmentation, which actually looks directly at this and important habitat patches to protect within the Bay Area that can make a difference for pumas. Um, so that's, that's going to be interesting once we get that done. Yolanda asks, do you work with universities or other labs to run these samples? And uh, yes, we do. Courtney? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have some um, colleagues that I worked with um, during my postdoctoral um, fellowship uh, that are up at Oregon State University and they're who we are collaborating with um, right now for our genetic work. Um, but we do, we work with other um, universities for other types of projects, um, specifically uh, San Francisco State University um, for some Lyme disease work that they're doing. And um, at UC Berkeley, the uh, Brashears Lab, we um, often share some data with them as well. Great, and our final question from Derek, and Derek, thank you for the nice uh, comment for our team. Um, but his question is, are, are we aware of any other individual schools or organizations who are working on this type of non-invasive tracking? And, uh, well, yeah. I mean, lots of groups are using cameras now. Um, I'm yes. not, you know, there's, there's some that are using SCAT, and I know the Department of Fish and Wildlife is using some of that. Um, hair in general is just harder, and so it's not as common uh, well, neither is SCAT, but um, I think 
you know, if you have more to add to that, Courtney, I think feel free. Well, the, the bio darts were primarily piloted by um, Washington Fish and Game, isn't that right, Zara? Yeah, yeah, um, Rich Beausoleil. Yeah. yeah, so that's um, it's a great concept. City, but um, right, so some of these other fish and wildlife departments are looking are, are developing these techniques um, to to do more non-invasive work but there's not um i haven't seen a lot of uh, systematic research programs um, comparing um, different sources of data often because data is hard to come by no matter who you are um, there's been a lot of development of statistical techniques where you can combine data from different sources so using camera traps and using collar data um, if all of these things are limited, if you can add them all together, they can create a really um, a much more uh, statistically robust model, depending on your research question. So I think um, most of the developments have been more on that side that I know of. Yeah, and also I'll mention uh, our colleagues at Stanford at Jasper Ridge, who are specifically working with the environmental soil science to answer some questions about mountain lions and other species. So there's a lot of, uh, of non-invasive work sort of in play right now. And so it's worth paying attention to these studies, but I know that the Jasper Ridge folks are working on some of this too. Mm -hmm. Good point. So I think we are, oh, we got Richard, was this the last webinar? This was the last webinar of this series, Richard. So we will probably um, set up another one in the fall. So check back in with us and um, we, will, we will sort of see how the response is for that. Um, but yes, this is the last for this series. And the last from Derek is to clarify, not cameras or collection, but audio deciphering bird calls and animal, small animal calls. So, so there is that work being done in other species like bats, um, specifically is what I've um, followed that research on. Um, pumas and, and wildcats in general are not um, consistent vocalizers. Um, so it can be difficult to have your audio up in a place um, where you are sure to get a puma call versus something like a bat where you know where they roost every night. Pumas are on the move all the time. Um, yeah. Except for maybe uh, new mothers are really the only ones that you can be sure where they are. And I'm not sure how useful um, that technique is if you already know where they are. Oh, I see. He's clarifying. Um, not the puma call, the birds telling each other the big cats are nearby. Nature's oh. informants, <laughs> of course. Um, oh. <laughs> Go ahead. So most bird calls, so birds will call obviously for predators. Um, I don't think most songbirds are worried about pumas because they're too small of a snack. Um, for pumas to really worry about. Um, bobcats, on the other hand, might be, they might be a good source of data for that, but it's um, typically those birds have one call for predator, so it's, you can't disentangle whether it's a puma or a bobcat or a coyote or a raccoon or something else of that nature. But that is a really cool thing. The other um, technology that people were starting to pilot was using drones um, to do some wildlife sampling, um, but there's been a sort of a, a pullback on that um, as the research came out that um, most wildlife are very aware of the drones and will change their behavior. So they're very affected by um, any kind of low flying drone. So that was kind of something that was really um, getting exciting for a while and now we're, we're sort of having to, to rethink that as a technology. Um, how can we make it quieter? How can we make it less visible? That sort of thing. Yeah and the, the thing about drones as they are getting quieter and they've become quite a bit quieter are the very onerous regulations in areas like the Bay Area where we would just not be able to fly them. So 
um, lots of you know habitats you cross or specifically regulated land say around SFO where we have a lot of puma movements um, up in the SFPUC uh, we just we wouldn't be able to run drones at all so that makes it difficult for us so we're going to close this out and thank you all for attending and joining us for our last webinar of our first series and uh, we hope that you will join us at a later time when we when we again put on a series of Knowing Wild Cats. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out and we will also make this webinar available uh, within 48 hours for uh, those of you who would like to view it again or share it. So- Thanks everybody and stay safe out there. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye. Take good care. <laughs>